How does contraception affect the body? What does natural birth offer over cesarean? How is breastfeeding optimized to improve mother-child bond? Today we'll hear how the good, the bad, and even the ugly bacteria influence these and other aspects of reproductive health for part one of this three-part series, which looks at women's microbiome health across the lifespan. For this, we're joined by one of America's leading medical voices on gut health, Dr. William Davis, a renowned cardiologist. Dr. Davis shifted his focus to gut health upon seeing dramatic changes in cardiac patients who made simple diet changes. This prompted his writing number one bestseller, Wheat Belly. Today, he reveals benefits of the good bacteria, including buffering against sexually transmitted diseases, urinary tract infections, and even postpartum depression. Welcome to Vital Science, where we learn how to get healthier from all angles, from the biochemical and nutritional to the things we do that nourish our minds and our souls. I'm Brandon Fallon. Dr. Davis, fantastic to have you join us on Vital Signs again. Thank you, Brandon. Glad to be back. And I'm very excited to get your insights on this topic, looking at women's health during their reproductive years and naturally their children's health. In terms of children's health, we see a kind of a, an escalation in, in certain diseases like neurodevelopmental diseases, um, asthma, um, obesity. Is this an example of where the microbiome factors in? And what would you say is the most compelling evidence of that? There's no question, Brendan, that the uh, disrupted microbiome is playing a big role in child health through every phase of childhood, infancy, toddlers, uh, older kids, teenagers, and of course into adulthood. Now, what's curious about all this was, you know, I think a lot of us presume that a child develops dysbiosis, a disrupted gastrointestinal microbiome, from exposure to antibiotics, which is often done at time of delivery and the first few years. You know, for every 1,000 children, there are over 1,300 prescriptions written every year for antibiotics. So that is a factor. But one of the things I'm hearing about, I'm not an obstetrician, I'm not a gynecologist, but I have a deep interest because I have a grant, I have a daughter-in-law who's delivered two children in the last couple of years. And I was appalled. Brenda, I was appalled at the information she was not given. This is a, this is a woman who has no problem with uh, medical resources, healthcare access, but was given virtually no empowering information, but given five courses of antibiotics in the third term of pregnancy and directed directed against what what is, what is that aimed against they the streptococcus and a number of other uh, uh potential pathogens so there's this overlap but that's true too. one of the things i'm seeing also is that babies have evidence for a disrupted microbiome why would that be it's probably a, con a confluence of factors so you know that almost half of all children now delivered by c-section and that deprives a child of the passage through the vaginal canal to acquire a microbiome that begins with vaginal microbes. And of course, I understand how difficult breastfeeding is. There's no question about that. But a lot of women don't do it or are incapable of doing it. That, by the way, has implications for our further discussion later on about lactobacillus reuter and oxytocin, because oxytocin is the hormone of breastfeeding. And women have lost that microbe and thereby the hormone of breastfeeding. And so if a child does not breastfeed, especially for a minimum of six months, once again, deprived of microbes from mom, breast milk has microbes. The breast itself has microbes. The child needs those microbes. And even worse, uh, young women who are of childbearing age have been exposed to all the disruptive factors that were all exposed to multiple courses of antibiotics, glyphosate, the active ingredient in the Roundup herbicide, uh, other herbicides, pesticides, stomach acid, blocking drugs, non sterile anti-inflammatory drugs, preservatives and emulsifying agents in food, on and on and on. All of us have a massively disrupted gastrointestinal and vaginal microbiome. When that woman delivers a child, the best she can do is give that child a disrupted microbiome because she herself has been disrupted. Now, shouldn't this be on the agenda of every obstetrician and gynecologist to say, listen, we need to talk about the microbes that put, we should do a vaginal swab to see what kind of micro microbes you have. And, or let's take some steps to make sure you have a healthy microbiome to enhance the chances you pass on healthy microbes to your child. Because that microbial composition has implications not for days or weeks, but for 
decades, the entire life of that child. Before we, we go into that further, Dr. Davis, just take a step back. And I think for our audience, it would be great to just define what it is because we, we hear this term so much nowadays. It's a hopeful sign that it, we hear it so much because people are becoming more aware of its significance. We talk about the microbiome and what specifically is the, the vaginal microbiome. So we usually talk about the gastrointestinal microbiome. That is the composition of microbes from mouth to anus. But it's, it's a varied ecosystem, Brendan, just like a tropical rainforest has a very different collection of animals and plants than, say, a desert. So the human gastrointestinal tract also has very distinct ecosystems. So the stomach microbiome is very different than the oral microbiome. The colonic microbiome is very different from the small intestine. So each region of the gastrointestinal tract has a unique ecosystem of, micro, of microbes. Now, that's also true, and the, the gastrointestinal microbiome is very complex. Thousands of different species, different locations, different composition in every part of the GI tract. The vagina is different. It's relatively straightforward. And one of the most important microbes in the vaginal canal is lactobacillus crispatus. And about a third of the world's female population has lost this, this microbe. Well, that's important because, once again, overexposure to antibiotics, uh, unhealthy practices that some ladies still do, like douching. They shouldn't do that. What is douching? Essentially rinsing out with a saline solution or some similar thing. Uh, or they take drugs that require insertion of a device to deliver a drug, like an antifungal drug. Well, that action introduces unhealthy microbes. And of course, you know, the vagina is close, is near. It's not connected directly, but it's near. It's contiguous to the anus and rectum. So the vagina is susceptible to fecal microbes that can probably travel via the skin so in the, the perineum, the groin area. Well, ladies should have, have a, a vaginal microbiome dominated by Lactobacillus crispatus and several other Lactobacillus species, Lactobacillus gasseri, Lactobacillus gensenii, Lactobacillus ensi. But it's crispatus that's the most important. This is unlike the gastrointestinal tract where there's not one single microbe that's dominant, there's many. But in the vagina, it's this one crispatus species. And if a woman has lost it because she took antibiotics or other reasons, she's more likely to miscarry during pregnancy. She's more likely to have premature labor. Premature labor can be catastrophic for that child. If a woman delivers a child, say, at 28 weeks, that child's going to be impaired psychologically, neurologically for a lifetime. So it's not just important for delivery in the first few weeks. It's important for a lifetime. So having crispatus reduce the likelihood of premature labor. It also causes a more healthy vaginal ecosystem. It increases vaginal moisture, reduces the potential for vaginal atrophy, because as ladies age, they get atrophy and dryness and irritation. So crispatus, very important. And even more remarkably, very, very excellent research from Loyola here in Chicago. And they showed that restoration to ladies who lack crispatus. So there's no connection between the vagina and the urinary bladder. There's no connection, <laughs> at least none that's known. They're near each other, but they're not connected directly. Well, a woman takes crispatus, let's say orally, as a probiotic. It colonizes the vagina, which in turn colonizes the bladder. This is revolutionary because we thought for <laughs> forever that the bladder is sterile. And now we don't know the bladder has a microbiome and the dominant microbiome is lactobacillus crispatus. And when it's allowed to colonize the urinary bladder, it reduces the frequency of urinary tract infections dramatically. How does that happen? How does it pass from the, the vaginal microbiome to the, the bladder? Well, there's two possible ways. One is via the skin and the other is by some means of what's called translocation. And it's not known exactly how. So it's, it's incomplete, Brent. No really knows for a fact how that's accomplished. But we do know it does do, do that, which is pretty remarkable. And so if a woman has repeated urinary tract infection, that's a really serious health problem because every time she has a new UTI, we say, she gets another round of antibiotics. I've seen women getting six, seven courses of antibiotics a year. And each time they get an antibiotic, their health deteriorates further because antibiotics are stupid. They're not selective for the microbe causing the urinary tract infection. In other words, if a woman has an E. coli 
UTI. There's no drug that's specific to E. coli. You take a drug with a broad spectrum of antibacterial activity, including hundreds of beneficial species in the gastrointestinal tract, vagina, and all the other microbiomes of the body. So a woman's health deteriorates. Now we know that restoration of this one microbe reduces the frequency of repeated urinary tract infections by about 50%. It's not 100%, but it's 50 And I've seen this play out in a lot of ladies in my audience who say, I'm doing it, and I haven't had a urinary tract infection in six months or whatever. What is this particular species doing to stop urinary tract infection? So it, it remains speculative, but it's probably some characteristic of the microbe. For, now we're getting a little bit into the science. So Crispatus has several features that makes it effective. One is it produces something called lactic acid. Lactic acid is antimicrobial to the pathogens of the bladder and the, and the vagina, like E. coli and candida. So it produces lactic acid and acidifies the vagina. A healthy vaginal canal is acidic. An unhealthy vaginal is less acidic or even alkaline. So production of lactic acid, an essential feature uh, of crispatus. Another feature is that crispatus is a very good producer of what's called bactericins. These are natural antibiotics effective against the species that cause urinary tract infections. And even more remarkably, this group also showed that not only does crispatus restoration reduce the frequency of urinary tract infections, it also reduced the frequency of what's called urge incontinence, a very embarrassing problem for many ladies where they cough or sneeze or anything that increases abdominal pressure and they wet themselves. They often have to wear diapers or have to wear other undergarments to capture the urine. Very embarrassing, as you can imagine. In a social situation, you're laughing at a party, you have a glass of wine, you're laughing, and you just wet yourself. And so Crispatus has been shown to reduce the frequency of urge incontinence. Brent, this is just the start of a revolution in new ways to manage all the unique problems that females experience. You can imagine the solution for repeated urinary tract infections is repeated antibiotics that destroy your health. Solutions for urge incontinence are surgical and they're awful, including when it's really bad, removal of the bladder, which is horrible, horrible. And so here we have uh, soft, wonderful. And you know what? So if you make yogurt, <laughs> the lack of this is crisp, I call it vagina yogurt. <laughs> it's the most delicious yogurt you've ever had. Isn't that cool? <laughs>